Welcome everyone to the first Clarion Cafe of the year. Um, today we are in for um, a very interesting topic um, on parliamentary corpora that were developed in the framework of the flagship project uh, for Clarin that has been um, going on for uh, quite some years now. Uh, but before we start, uh, I would like to give a quick um, overview of what's um, planned for today's session. So first I'll open and give a brief introduction into Clarin, and then the parliament team will take over. They will introduce the project. They will describe the uh, corporate that were developed in the project and then focus a little bit uh, on uh, the metadata that were added, the machine translated uh, part of the corpora, a pilot on the spoken data uh, for the parliamentary debates, on uh, very exciting semantic tagging initiatives in parliament. And then we will continue with more research related aspects of the project for political linguistics research, uh, for political science research, as well as hear from contributors to parliament from our national nodes, Catalan, uh, Hungarian and Austrian uh, corpora will be uh, presented briefly. Uh, at the end, we will open the floor for any questions and comments from the audience so that we can also end with a more intro interactive session. For now, I think we can proceed with a brief intro into uh, Clarin for the people who do not yet know who we are. I'm not going to click on any of these links. These are for you to take a look at uh, later on. The first First one is a, a quick um, video about uh, what Clarin is and what you can expect from us. And the second one is um, a brief um, introduction to Clarin in textual form. Thanks. We can move to the next slide. Um, Clarin is a common uh, language resources and technology infrastructure. We have been operating since uh, 2012, so we have quite a long history. Um, and we provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences, as well as um, the any data science initiatives and computational linguistics uh, that is working with language data. We provide access to digital language data in all modalities, written, spoken, and multimodal forms, as well as advanced tools to analyze this data, to process this data, as well as um, uh, combine the data wherever they are located uh, in our distributed network. We offer si single sign-on environments so that you can access uh, the data anywhere you are from. Um, and we, uh, in addition to the technical infrastructure, also offer rich uh, knowledge infrastructure. We are um, part of a bigger European landscape of research infrastructures. Uh, we belong to the SSH, Open Cluster, or in short, SHOC, and are also an integral part of EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, Clarin, for now, has a distributed network of over 70 centers, and currently we have 24 full members. Our most recent um, member that has joined is not even from Europe, but South Africa. So welcome South Africa. Uh, this is an official uh, public event where we are um, embracing them for the first time. And we also have two observers. One is Switzerland and the other one is the UK. Uh, parliamentary data that we will be focusing on uh, in this session are just part of a uh, bigger initiative uh, called the Clarin Resource Families, under which we are giving um, user-friendly overviews um, uh, according to the data type um, of all the available language resources and tools in Clarin uh, that we can offer to our users. And I'm adding a link to the uh, list of all these resource families on this slide. And below is just a quick uh, screenshot of the parliamentary resource family. Next slide, please. That's all from me. There's a lot more to find out about Clarin. Please investigate our website and subscribe to our newsletter if you're interested in more details. And uh, for now, I give the floor to the parliament team who have prepared a very interesting program for you. Please. I would like to start by just to, to say a few words. 
about uh, this uh, parliament project. Uh, and it is also on behalf of Mache uh, because we were uh, co-coordinators of uh, this nice initiative. And uh, of course, afterwards, you uh, will hear a lot uh, details about the real work that was done. But um, yeah, let's begin. So um, it says Parliament, it's a Clarin uh, flagship project that uh, also Daria mentioned. But I would say that from today's perspective, it is really more than a project. It's also a real framework, uh, a real infrastructure that um, also uh, posits um, a de facto standard on parliamentary data. So um, it was conducted in two stages. You can see the years, 2020-2021 um, uh, and 2022-2023. Uh, so uh, we have 27 members officially, but uh, non-officially there are more. Uh, you can also go and check more information on the Parliament web page with the main results and the last releases. Um, and uh, the main task of this project was to um, produce some really comparable uh, encoded transcriptions of speeches from the national and regional parliaments. Uh, so at the same time, they took cover also the same period. Um, okay, and to be richly annotated. Uh, next slide, please. Why um, this project was needed, this initiative was needed, it was high time uh, to have some um, comparability between uh, or to enhance some comparability among national corpora and not to focus only on the European Parliament because as we can see in recent years, it is very important to know what comes from the national governments and national parliaments into uh, European Parliament and into Europe. So this data would be valuable for digital humanities, of course, uh, for observing these political and social tendencies in different societies. And also um, it is really crucial for policy making. Next slide. And here you can see also um, that we started at the COVID times. And uh, unfortunately, but uh, what we could predict, uh, it was a health crisis. And now we uh, experience uh, another kind of crisis. And um, that um, also points to the importance of such uh, data. Yeah. Um, just um, a few words, as I said, not going too deep into that. Um, the corpora, uh, the data are available in two modes, as data itself and in concordancing tools. Also, they are released uh, only with this metadata, but really rich metadata, and uh, Thomas will uh, say more. Uh, just in a, a minute or two, and also with linguistic annotations. And another teaser that you'd, I put here, but uh, Chagra is here and later on uh, he, he can say a bit more that there is a shared task at uh, Clay uh, 2024. And uh, of course, everyone is invited uh, to participate and to also to invite uh, groups to participate into that. Yeah, and uh, this is, I think, the last slide here. As I already uh, started with it, it is no more just a project. It is a um, framework. It's an infrastructure. Um, you can check uh, guidelines, um, validation procedures for parliamentary data, documentation, samples. Um, anybody can um, make a corpus uh, using these best practices from parliament. And also there is a big community already um, behind uh, Parliament. And uh, as I already said, the common goal is just to make national corpora speak among themselves and only at the central European and beyond Euro European level. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess you can hear me, yes. Um, 
So I will present the corpora that we produced. So the latest version, as you can see, there's been four of them. In fact, there were more because we had minor versions as well. Anyway, the latest one that is uh, the final uh, deliverable for the project, which ended as Petya said in September, is 4.0. Uh, so what can I say about this? From, from the start already up to 4.0, uh, the common characteristics of the corpora are uh, essentially that the encoding is, uh, is as similar or as identical as you could possibly make it. Uh, we had quite a few discussions before Parliament was ever, ever dreamt of about the best way to encode parliamentary corpora for digital humanities research, and we settled on a TI-based encoding. So um, what we made uh, in Parliament 2 is a proper TI-based uh, Parliament schema. That is something that is encoded is in what is in TI called an odd, uh, what document does it all. So we have a TI document, which first of all defines the formal schema and also gives the guidelines. So from this odd, what you can do then is, and what we did of course, is to convert it into XML schemas, so you can use them for validation, but also convert the guidelines into an HTML form, which you can then read. Uh, and so people can read at this address here. So this is the GitHub pages, uh, where quite detailed instructions are given how Parliament Corpora are encoded. And there, of course, uh, the par current Parliament Corpora are encoded in this way. Uh, so, um, as you can see, we were based on GitHub uh, as far as the development went. Uh, and on the on the GitHub of Parliament, you can find, uh, first of all, samples of the corpora, so people can have a look at them, because often seeing a sample is much easier to get an impression what's in there than reading the quite extensive guidelines. Uh, there's the schema there as well. I already said on Parliament pages, there are the guidelines and all the scripts that we use to actually produce the corpora. Uh, not to produce from their source form, but from what the partners <clears throat> uh, delivered to the uh, distribution of the corpora. There's still a few steps in between. And these steps, which have to do with the validation and the down conversion of the TI encoded corpora into more immediately usable formats are all on GitHub. Uh, one word of caution here, uh, this was a bottom-up project in the sense that individual, uh, a huge number of individual partners produced the corpora. So not, even though we tried really hard, not all the details are always the same. Uh, and as I said, at the end of the day, we, uh, this was basically me at the Jorge Stefan Institute and Matthias Kopp at Ufal uh, in Prague. Uh, we developed this finalization procedure which, uh, yeah, uh, some things are uh, made more, more uniform, some common data is put in there, uh, everything is validated, and the corpora are down converted into plain text, uh, Connell U files, vertical files, uh, and so on. So, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, what is the basic information uh, included in the corpora? Uh, parliaments have a long uh, history. Uh, depending on the on the country, of course, uh, and this history is quite different. So the way they're set up is quite different. We try to the best of our abilities to capture these differences, but also commonalities. <clears throat> so we have encoded various aspects of the parliaments uh, for each corpus. Uh, the bit that we're quite proud of is the metadata on speakers because we have their names, their genders, whether they're MP or not for each speech, whether they're uh, speaking as uh, a guest, a regular speaker, or the chair. Uh, something that has been added in Parliament too is who is a minister and who is not, which can sometimes affect um, various analysis and their party affiliations. Uh, and we also went to quite a bit of trouble to get as much metadata on the parties as we could. So already in Parliament 1, we had which parties are in coalition and depending on the country opposition and something that's have been added now in parliament too and which we will hear more about is adding the left right political orientation and the chapel hill survey uh, variables and then the speeches themselves are marked by the speaker 
not invariably, but in a large percentage of the cases and the role. And then we also, uh, in, in the transcripts themselves, we retained the marked up transcriber comments. Uh, some corpora, this depends on the corpus, have further information like links to Wikipedia pages, uh, the year of birth of the speakers, uh, membership in various committees, etc. So this is the kind of the metadata. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, the data itself is, of course, the transcripts. Uh, here, already in Parliament 1, we did linguistic processing, so tokenization, sentence segmentation, and amortization. And then uh, we were, of course, very happy uh, that universal dependencies exist because not only can we find a common framework for all these languages, but there's also UDPipe, for instance, and uh, Stanza, which took universal dependencies, um, tree banks as training data so we could uh, yeah, annotate all the corpora with universal dependencies information. Plus we also uh, did named entity recognition with the standard for, for class system. And something that is new in Parliament too is the machine translation and semantic annotation, again, which we'll, you will hear more about uh, in, in a short while. So uh, the latest release of the corpora, as I mentioned, is 4.0. As all the releases, this is uh, distributed under the very permissive Creative Commons uh, attribution license. And as was already said, uh, the, the main parliament corpora, there's also the speech part, again, which you will hear more about later. But the main part uh, of the corpora is uh, in three repository entries. One is the multilingual comparable corpora uh, 4.0, which is all TI encoded, but has like non-annotated text, non-linguistically annotated text. Uh, the second one has these added linguistic information. And the third one is the machine translated one. So three entries. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, as again, as, as uh, Petya mentioned, we also have online analysis options. Uh, these are the concordances at uh, the Slovenian Clarin. And here you can see the keywords of the COVID subcorpus, but they're not actually keywords, but they're the semantic classes, which you will hear about in a second. And as you can see, most of them do have something to do with COVID, but also weather, uh, which is yeah, a reflection of the uh, global warming, which is also discussed in the, in the parliaments. Uh, so next slide. Ah, here we have one empty slide uh, for TI uh, talk, which is also another um, service that has been added in Parliament 2. And that's another kind of take on the corpora. You can do concordance analysis there, but you can also uh, browse through the metadata or, or kind of read uh, the transcripts kind of like a digital library. And so next uh, and last slide. Um, I should note that we haven't quite finished with Parliament yet, even though the project is over now. And we're working on, on two things. One is writing up uh, what we did in a journal publication. And we are at the same time working on a maintenance release 4.1. Uh, the main uh, kind of as, as far as the individual corpora go, the main difference is that the Ukrainian corpus has been significantly extended in the meantime. It now goes up to November 2023 and starts in 2002, so much bigger than it was. Uh, we will do some bug fixes, stuff that we find that is wrong in 4.0. And yes, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, language resources and evaluation in general. So this was a short presentation from me. Uh, thank you very much. And we're moving on now to the metadata. Hi, uh, so I will be presenting uh, our work on adding the metadata to the Parliament Corpora, also on behalf of our colleague, Yuris Kubitz, who sadly today cannot be with us. Um, so we have tried to enrich the corpora with two uh, specific metadata. First, the metadata on the ministerial position of individual speakers, as well as political orientation metadata on the um, political parties within the parliament corpora. So for the metadata on ministers, the, uh, the data collection was manual, uh, mostly supported with uh, Wikipedia. Uh, although for some individual corpora, we have also used uh, several different 
um, sources. For example, for Slovenian corpus, we also found information on the governmental uh, governmental web pages and other material late, related to this. Uh, and the data set is available as uh, separate TCB files for individual countries and uh, are also encoded to the parliament corpora within the list person uh, uh, elements. And below we can see an example of how person is encoded with the affiliation element um, for um, minister role. Next slide, please. Uh, so for political orientation metadata, we have used three different sources. First of all, we had the uh, Chapel Hill Expert Survey data set, which is an expert data set with built-in contextual and domain knowledge provided uh, with uh, the help of um, political scientists. It, had, it holds 85 distinct variables on a given political position for each party as well as the year covered. Uh, first, we have focused on one specific variable indicating the party's position in relation to its overall ideological stance which has been the best approximation of the political orientation metadata, um, but later also decided to integrate all of the 85 chess variables into the corpora. So while this is an expert data set with, a, with valuable information, it also has a lot of missing data. It has missing data for certain periods, individual political parties, as well as the entire countries that are present in parliament, but not in chess data set. So next slide, please. Uh, so to remedy this, we also use the secondary source, which is Wikipedia, where we have manually extracted the information, uh, which can be seen on the first image. So within the Wikipedia info boxes, as well as entire entries, if this was not available from the get-go. So we have gathered the values from this political position uh, info boxes. And in the table, you can see the range of the values that have been uh, gathered from the far left to far right with all our other values that are not necessarily indicated within this spectrum, for example, Big Ten or a Pirate Party. Uh, this also provided us with a uh, better coverage uh, where we have provided over uh, 900 entities. Uh, the third op and optional data source that we also used was the encoder option where the data encoders, which are essentially compilers of the corpus, were um, provided an ID, and we asked them to add their information on the orientation data for the individual parties and countries. And this was mainly to mark political parties that were not covered by Wikipedia. And currently, this is only used for Ukraine, Portugal, and Belgium. So the values are encoded in the corpora, and we also added the, taxon the taxonomies and their translations. Next slide, please. Um, and in this figure, you can also see an example of political orientation taxonomy. Uh, and overall, we have provided metadata on minister or ministerial positions of individual speakers. We have captured political orientation for more than 350 political parties in parliament using three different sources, where chess uh, represented an expert data set with valuable and accurate um, data, but uh, had a lot of missing data, which was then remedied by using Wikipedia to not only provide the missing data, but also enable us to compare data between sources. Uh, and the encoder, where we have gathered the data from partners that know their political bodies. Uh, so while the entire data set is available uh, in different formats, the Wikipedia values were also integrated within the concordancers, and that can enable a further analysis. So this is, yes, all from my side. Thank you. Hi, I, as Tomas mentioned, we also decided to machine translate all of the corpora. And this was to enable the users to be able to research and query the corpora using one language, one common language. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, the parliament collection has 29 European languages. And we translated them using a machine translation system to English. As this collection is a, a very big one containing about of one, one billion words, uh, we had to find an empty system 
that is open source and that covers all of our 29 languages. Uh, we found that the Opus MT model, which is provided by the Helsinki NLP group, is a very good fit for our needs. And we also evaluated for each of the language, we evaluated multiple Opus MT models that were uh, provided for this language or for the language group to find the language model, um, MT model that works the best for each target language. Uh, inside the project, we translated the utterances, which we extracted from the source conlu files, as well as the transcriber's notes. And at the end of the pipeline, we also linguistically annotated the English text uh, by using the Stanza pipeline. And all of the code for machine translation, as well as linguistic annotation, is available uh, on GitHub. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we encountered uh, quite a lot of challenges, of course, and uh, they were mostly connected with machine translation uh, specificities. Uh, one of them is that we noticed that uh, there are quite a lot of incorrect proper noun translations. Uh, we can see, for instance, that one a Slovenian politician, Smago Ilicic Plemeniti, was found to be translated as the winner of the welcomes, and uh, we found uh, some other very uh, funny translations as well. So uh, we um, developed a method to correct such uh, incorrect proper noun translations. So as we had linguistically annotated source files, we extracted named entities from them, then aligned uh, the extracted wor uh, words with the translations and substituted them if uh, we found that they don't match. Uh, however, some uh, named entities um, weren't, uh, some named entity recognition outputs were of a too low quality uh, to be used. So this wasn't applied to all of the corpora. Uh, in addition, some corpora are in two languages. For instance, Ukrainian corpora uh, consisted of some Russian as well, and the Belgian corpus consists of Dutch and French. Uh, in case of related languages, um, this wasn't uh, a problem as we were able to use the, an Opus MT system that was specialized for the language group. And in case of uh, non-related languages, we split the corpus into two and then translated them separately before joining, joining them to do linguistic annotation. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, however, at the end, we should note that uh, machine translation still isn't perfect. And a uh, very small uh, analysis um, suggests that there could be 20 to 30% of sentences that have some errors in them. Uh, so uh, it is important to note that uh, this uh, having machine translation tr uh, is a very good uh, resource to be able to search throughout all of the corpora. However, it is still required to cross-check with the source file. And uh, we warmly welcome all of the uh, further studies, studies of translation quality and the empty systems that we used. Uh, just uh, to put some examples, for instance, uh, there could be some wrong terms, uh, repetitions. Uh, you should also be aware of uh, some literal translations of multi-word expressions, which could uh, result in erroneous um, sentences, as well as uh, hallucinations, which means that the output it doesn't have anything in common with the source text. However, most of the texts are uh, reliable and of high quality. That's all from my side. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicola, and I will be presenting the results on spoken data. So next slide, please. Uh, uh, so the work package inside we worked, we called it Parla Speech as a spin-off of the Parliament um, uh, name, because parliaments, we saw them always as great opportunity for spoken data for multiple reasons. First of all, we have spoken data available for a significant number of languages that mostly don't have spoken data available as easily which is very important because uh, spoken data are heavily um, uh, weighted down by intellectual property rights, privacy. It's considered to be a biometric signal, so very pro uh, problematic given the new e European Union, AI Act, etc. 
And uh, the parliamentary spoken data are part of the public domain, so they are up for grabs for uh, heavy exploitation, as we would call it. Uh, furthermore, inside Parliament, we knew there will be quite a lot of textual transcripts. So our obvious goal was to uh, pilot opportunities to align uh, the spoken data on one side with the transcripts on the other side. And what we have promised are at least 50 hours and the description of the methodology uh, for a set of languages. Next slide, please. Of course, we uh, knew it won't be as easy as we would like to. The two biggest problems in parliamentary data, if uh, speech data are to be harvested, are, first of all, the order of textual transcripts and spoken materials is often not identical, so one cannot uh, assume um, the same order of things in the data. And second of all, not everything is being transcribed as well as not everything is being recorded that might have been transcribed by some means. So the approach that we had to develop was fuzzy matching of all the recordings on one side with all the transcripts on the other side, which proved to be a rather techn technically harsh uh, problem because the search space is quite big. However, um, the dates could have helped uh, in limiting the search space uh, significantly. And this work could not have been done, I must say, without the collaboration with Daniel Korzynek, uh, our contact through the Polish Parliament partner. Next slide, please. So the approach that we took uh, up to now is the one uh, shown in the right. Of course, the idea is not for me to describe it in detail, but just to say the bad side of this approach, that it's rather complicated. As you can see, it has more or less uh, five or six uh, uh, modules that are uh, in, uh, dependent in between each other. However, the very good is once this procedure has been set up, we, have we are testing it now in the third language, and it seems to be very robust. Regardless of the difference in the problems that we find in the speech uh, data of different parliaments, this uh, method provides results, which is great. Um, and the idea is here that since we now we have the method set up, that we are not supposed to stop at two or three languages, but continue in many more languages. And the parallel speech results so far. So we had an early uh, delivery of, parallel, of the Croatian parallel speech in 2022. Uh, with some 1800 uh, hours uh, of data. Very, I mean, this is just a show of how useful these data are. This was in this was until recently the only Croatian uh, speech and text data set, which, what is, which is the reason why the NVIDIA's official model for Croatian is based actually on our, our data set only. Uh, a few days ago, we released Parallel Speech HR uh, 2.0, which is almost twice the size. But what is even more important, it follows the linguistic structure of sentences. So it does not follow the structure of uh, silences, but rather linguistic sentences as can be found in the transcripts. And another thing, we also publish it not only on the uh, repository, but also in the concordance. So now, not so technically savvy people can search through the collections and find speeches of people saying specific words from specific backgrounds, etc. Also, we are finalizing the Polish version of Parallel Speech, roughly 1,000 hours in size, and the Serbian version, which will be roughly 2,000 hours in size. Thanks. So, in Lancaster, as well as um, uh, being responsible for the collection and um, conversion of the UK Hansard data, we were also responsible for the semantic tagging of all of the data uh, once they'd been machine translated. Uh, next slide, please. So in case you're not already familiar with semantic tagging, this has been used for some um, existing national corpora, such as the two versions of the British national corpus, as well as the Welsh national corpus from the Cork Inc project. So I've got an example here. It's as you would expect, each word in the text gets assigned a label representing its semantic field. So uh, you can see those highlighted in blue. Uh, but one of the key things about the semantic tagger that we've used is also that it deals with multi-word expressions. And these are obviously really important for uh, uh, understanding or annotating the meaning of the words in the text. We roughly estimate that around 16% of running text uh, for English uh, fits into multi-word expressions that we would want to assign semantic fields to the whole phrase rather than uh, individual words. Okay, next slide, please. So the system we used was what we developed in Lancaster over the last um, couple of decades, the UCREL semantic analysis system. 
and this assigns uh, coarse grained semantic fields for the sense in context uh, to all words in the text. Um, so uh, you can, can compare and contrast that with other systems that just pick a subset of the vocabulary. And as I've said, uh, multi-word expressions are a particularly important thing that we consider in the USAS tagger. So uh, for English, phrasal verbs, noun phrases, proper names, and true non-compositional idiomatic expressions would all be tagged with one semantic field for the whole phrase. And there's more details there on the links to the USAS tagger and all of the lexicons for the USAS taggers are available on that GitHub link with a Creative Commons license. So in terms of the taxonomy that we use, this was originally derived from Tom MacArthur's Longman lexicon, and we've subdivided categories within that. So there's uh, 21 major domains, and that breaks down into 232 semantic fields that we uh, use this kind of category system to divide up the world and try and assign the coarse grain semantic field in context. And the version that, of the USAS tagger that we use for the Parliament project was the latest version of the Python open source version of the tagger. This has an Apache license. We've got resources not just for English, but other languages, as you can see here. It's a rule-based tagger uh, based on the knowledge bases in the lexicons, which we give it in advance. It identifies words and multi-word expressions, as I've mentioned. It generally supports uh, multiple languages in terms of part of speech tagging and lemmatization through existing spacey pipelines, and then adds on to that the semantic field tagging. It's also flexible for other languages that you can incorporate if spacey uh, standard pipelines don't support those. And there's more details there on that link. Thanks. Uh, so uh, one of the key challenges that we faced in running this system over the 1 billion word plus corpus that we have in Parliament uh, was to parallelize that in a sufficiently efficient way uh, that we could achieve the tagging in a reasonable amount of time. We performed the semantic tagging on the Connell U format directly, and uh, we were able to make use of the structure of the data that we received to parallelize across the languages and years and that helped us reduce the tagging time down from 18 days to just around 12 hours. And just to acknowledge support from my colleagues, Daisy Lal for the Connell U processing script and John Viddler for designing the parallelization. And also uh, thanks to Oracle Research for the compute cluster that we used. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. I'll go through a few simple research examples uh, where I was involved in uh, by using Parliament, which without Parliament, they would not be possible. So next slide, please. The first one was my first experience with uh, working with the Parliament uh, Corpora, which was at the Digital Humanities Hackathon in Helsinki 2022. And it's already kind of a tradition that this uh, corpora, as it evolves, uh, uh, they're used in the Digital Humanities Hackathon for uh, students to research and explore uh, the data. So uh, in the first endeavor, we were an interdisciplinary group uh, that asked a very simple uh, research question on the balance of uh, gender in Parliament, and we basically measured very uh, three very simple uh, measures. So female representation in Parliament, their active participation, and their, their passive relevance in terms of how much they're mentioned in the discussions. And we noticed that uh, in all the European parliaments that we explored, there is a high imbalance where the representation is expect expectedly lower than 50%, but even then, the active relevance and the passive relevance are uh, uh, even lesser. So here, the speech metadata, the names, the gender, uh, and the number of speeches for each speaker, along with the linguistic annotations of named entities were key components for us to do uh, the research very easily, 
for several languages using basically the same pipeline. So next slide, please. Uh, my second uh, work was trying to understand the political leanings in the Slovenian parliament. And here we wanted to use explainable AI as a complement to qualitative research. So what we did is here we used the Slovenian trans transcripts along with the left and right leaning party annotations to train machine learning models that will predict if a speech is given by a left leaning or, or right leaning MP. And then by explaining the models, uh, get the uh, key linguistic features that um, are associated with left and right leaning uh, uh, political ideology. Uh, next slide, please. The third one was again at the Digital Humanities Hackathon a year uh, after. And this time we were a much bigger group. So our aims were even higher than the last year. So we, this time we wanted to understand pol political polarization in parliaments through the speeches that are given. So we took all the transcripts of several parliaments. We divided them into several topics. And then using a large language model, we embedded these uh, speeches and speakers into a vector space where we could uh, measure the distances between different groups and see where the linguistic differences and uh, pol polarization is higher for specific topics and specific countries. And finally, uh, in the next slide, uh, is something I'm currently working on which is kind of combining all of these uh, features uh, that uh, I've already used in the previous researchers, uh, which is on the, uh, here we are trying to measure if effective polarization is uh, evident in European parliaments. And here we co we're combining the transcripts, the metadata on opposition coalition, uh, the named entities, and on top of that, we are using Parlacent, which is a, a large language model uh, trained to uh, annotate uh, sentiment in parliamentary speeches. And we basically want to uh, measure if uh, groups tend to be more negative toward the other group than compared to their own uh, here in terms of coalition and opposition. And we are showing here that for six of the parliaments that are available uh, in parliament, this is really the case. So yeah, these are uh, kind of uh, mini projects that would absolutely not be possible um, uh, if, you, if you don't have such a resource and, as parliament, especially if you want to do a cro a cross country analysis, right? Uh, yeah, that's all for me. And I leave the floor to Michal. Um, okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I will briefly talk about using uh, uh, parliamentary data in social science research. More specifically, I talk about studying war in parliamentary debates. Uh, and I'm focusing on, on um, our countries of former Yugoslavia. Next, please. So um, let me start with general notion that uh, studying uh, sensitive topics like war is not an easy task. Uh, it naturally comes with um, ethical and research challenges um, that are often hard to overcome, and this is especially relevant um, when it comes to political elites. The, the truth is that uh, they are not happy when they are studied um, and um, even actively resist that. So for instance, you often cannot interview them or do a survey, and uh, I'm not even um, talking about their honesty. Um, so a lot of studies um, rely on observations, um, and uh, this is um, uh, an opportunity for parliamentary data uh, um, to serve as a, as a great source of information on how political elites uh, behave in their natural environment. And uh, Parliament really shines in this regard, especially when combined with, with uh, NLP and NLU tools. Uh, and, I, and I can say or I believe that potential for being uh, the most important resource in Parliament studies is, is um, undeniable uh, if the uh, political science community uh, knows about this resource. Um, so. Um, this is especially true for uh, complex, uh, complex topics like war. Um, um, for countries with a recent history of armed conflict, parliamentary proceedings are often uh, one of the few resources available that are uh, systematic and inclusive. 
Um, also, it's possible to study the role of war uh, um, in national parliaments without the need to actually interact with the parliamentaries, but par parliamentarians, uh, and believe me, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, as post-conflict societies uh, usually deal with a lot of problems, um, having such an exhaustive uh, data source provides a great opportunity to study uh, post-conflict dynamics more systematically. Uh, and in this context, again, uh, parliament can play a crucial role uh, uh, because it has a complex overview of uh, war in Ukraine in, in, in uh, different countries, and there's a ton of data for political scientists to work with. Um, and when it comes to actual applications that involves um, uh, things like mapping concept and discourse, but also testing hypotheses about how war impacts political arenas in Europe. Um, next, please. So um, a similar aspect perspective was also implemented by uh, ERC funded project was part of at the University of Luxembourg. And within that project, I was mostly interested in how world legacies affect the political reality of three countries of Yugoslavia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, and Serbia. Um, in order to study this, uh, I started collecting corporate parliamentary speeches that were later uh, incorporated into a parliament project and further extended with, uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Nikola Lubesic. Uh, we also used the corpora for sampling data to train a domain specific sentiment classifier intended for use specifically with parliamentary data. Um, and both the training data set and the classifier are available online for free to use. Uh, uh, by anyone. So long story short, I, I studied the corpora for more than two years um, and the results are presented in an upcoming book called War Narratives in Post-Conflict Societies, Keeping the Past Alive in the Former Yugoslavia. Uh, and it uh, should be out next month. Um, next, please. So when it comes to the actual content, one of the main goals was to understand when uh, a war is discussed, by whom and how. Uh, and the, the book applies very inductive strategy, starts with a lot of data and then narrows it down to uh, key issues, uh, concepts and topics that are uh, uh, studied, explored, and then uh, transformed uh, to hypotheses that can be texted. Uh, um, so I started with, with the simple mapping, uh, uh, simple idea of mapping political discourse of war, uh, identifying um, uh, hotspots of, of war discourse and, and um, for example, um, um, constructing a discursive network that exploits properties of high dimensional vector space of war embeddings of keywords that are associated with war um, and uh, conflict. Next, please. With that, um, I was sure that um, certain topics and, and issues are really relevant, so I, I started exploring uh, the context. Um, with a mixture of methods um, ranging from close reading to a la carte embeddings, uh, um, I was able to uh, study differences in discourse various groups, as well as uh, to understand more nuanced changes over time. Um, these yield very interesting results, uh, sometimes even challenging the common knowledge. A good example is uh, debunking the myth that Bosnian war politics is driven by three sided conflict among Bosnians, Croats, and Serbs. In fact, the main cleavage uh, exists along Bosnian Serb strife, um, and Croat MPs truly take the back, back seat. Uh, they are not that active, uh, which goes against um, the mainstream or common, common notion of, of how Bosnian politics uh, work. Next, please. And finally, um, because we had, uh, I had a lot of insights and, and, and uh, um, uh, unique overview of how po war politics work in, in these three countries, uh, gave me a good opportunity to form a hypothesis uh, um, focused on testing um, actual drivers of uh, war discourse and exploring actual drivers of war discourse uh, in terms of uh, salience of the topic, but also a specific way of how par parliamentarians talk about war uh, using sentiment markers. And because I don't have time to explain or, or present every, every, uh, everything that I have there in the book, uh, I would like to mention two most important findings first. Uh, the war doesn't play does does play an important role in in, in the study parliaments uh, and its presence is not fading away. Uh, and contrary, it's getting darker and more severe, showing its use uh, strategically as a political token. And the second finding is that uh, MPs with war pass uh, or uh, being connected with regions with high salience of war legacies are the main drivers of war discourse in the study parliaments, which means that the legacies of war live with them and they demonstrate this descriptive representation on uh, a daily basis. Um, to conclude, the parliamentary corpora uh, are unique data source that uh, um, will help political science uh, uh, as a field uh, a lot. Uh, many of these insights I, I, I have uh, in, in the book uh, would not be possible 
uh, without uh, uh, starting parliamentary proceedings. Uh, and uh, I'm confident that um, parliament and parliamentary uh, data um, uh, will become standards uh, when it comes to um, um, parliamentary research in general. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm going to present the, a, a specific language of, of National Corpus, the Catalan Parliament Corpus. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Marina Pisani, Rodolfo Ceballos, and myself. And actually, I want also to thank very much Ivan Antiba, who was one of my former students at the start of the work with uh, uh, Parliament uh, Corpora, and also to the publications department of the Parliament de Catalunya that uh, provided us with the uh, source files for this uh, corpus. Uh, next, uh, please. So I don't know if you locate more or less where Catalonia is, it's part of Spain. And uh, uh, actually in Spain, we have different uh, parliaments in each in, you know, uh, the different autonomous uh, regions or autonomous uh, uh, bodies or governments. So uh, for parliament, there, there are four different uh, corpora depending on the language. So we have the Galician, the Basque, the Spanish, Spanish, and then the Catalan one. Here you have some uh, amount, uh, uh, so, some figures about uh, how this Parliament Catalan corpus looks like. The temporal span is uh, from 2015 to August uh, 22. They, it covers 60, uh, 365 uh, uh, speakers and uh, 286 uh, sessions, plenary sessions. And actually, it amounts to 15 uh, million uh, and a half votes. One of the particularities of our corpus is that actually it is bilingual. It has uh, documents or segments in Catalan and in Spanish, and actually in other languages like Aranese, another official language in Catalonia, and English. Now we can go uh, one more. Piece. Oh. Um, as I told you, the the, one of the particularities of our corpus is bilingual data, and actually this uh, was one of the key points for us to prefer to work with a document, the word document that the Parliament Publication Office was uh, willing to provide us with. In the Word XML data, we could retrieve or recover metadata, uh, for instance, for the languages other than Catalan, for the segments that were in other languages, and also uh, for all the things like uh, the annotations made by that the transcriber, uh, transcribers did for the different incidents during the sessions. These are the ones you can see here as in uh, italics and uh, between, uh, as parentheticals. So we could convert all these uh, transcription uh, comments into metadata, but could be very interesting to us. Um, we also get to to take into account the different languages, and because there were some of the segments that weren't really clear the language it was, uh, we used a uh, additionally the Google Language Detector to verify the language uh, of the of the speaker. As you see here, we have the identification of the different people, and you see this is a normal way of uh, things. So um, someone speaks in Catalan, and then uh, there is an answer, or, or the, the person who speaks uh, is speaking in Spanish. This would be a normal uh, way. Uh, next slide, please. But it's also true that uh, we have uh, different particularities with respect to this bilingual situation, so that there is code switching. There can be a speaker like this one that is uh, as starts speaking in Catalan, uh, but then it changes into Spanish. Uh, and then, but more interestingly, you see that uh, he can be using a name in Spanish. So this will be the writing and actually the transcription of the Spanish pronunciation of a name, but then using uh, another translate uh, another name, proper name uh, in the Catalan uh, spelling, okay? While inside the, Sp the Spanish uh, uh, part of the, of the segment is again using a Spanish uh, pronunciation and the transcriber also uses the Spanish spelling of... So actually it's not only having the problem of, of identifying segment by segment, 
Uh, so we couldn't work at the level of paragraph, but uh, on the smaller pieces, so as to identify exactly for each segment which was the language. But also we had to get, pay a lot of attention to uh, handle correctly the, the name entity recognition, because it was very important exercise, please. Uh, it was very important for identifying the speakers. Obviously, uh, one of the good features of Parlamin is that uh, uh, every speech is linked or uh, identified with a specific ID, where you, and then this ID has uh, additional information, additional metadata, and this is quite important. So uh, we had problems because not only these different spelling uh, that transcribers use, but also because uh, we had problems with uh, uh, the, uh, the different uh, variations or naming variation due to bilingualism uh, and that uh, transcribers uh, didn't follow really a consistent approach. So for you to have an idea, uh, you probably already know that in Spain we have, or we can use one or two family names and then this will be two examples, uh, Per Aragonés or Per Aragonés García. But moreover, uh, in Catalan, there can be a conjunction. So you, uh, this would mean Josep González and Cambrai, okay? But it can also be substituted with a dash or with nothing. Uh, besides, uh, we can also have different accentuation patterns, as we have seen, depending if the transcription is using the Spanish or the Catalan. So here you say Josep González with this accent, open accent, because it's the Catalan spelling, but uh, here we have this close accent because it's the Spanish. Uh, and besides, so uh, you have to realize that we have to parse all the files looking for the different possible combinations. And moreover, we also can have a variation because of compound nouns. The very Catholic uh, naming for girls was Maria something. I am Maria Nuria, for instance. And then here we have Maria Sumcio, but it can be spelled like M dot, like an abbreviation, another type of abbreviation of just uh, the, the name. Uh, this was actually, as I tell you, the, one of the, our worst problems to have uh, this uh, identification of the speakers uh, correctly because of all this variation in the names. Next uh, slide, please. So for pro uh, we uh, finally processed all this, uh, despite that uh, there were, uh, we had some difficulties to find name to recognition for Catalan. We finally used Freeling, uh, one of uh, the pipelines for processing and uh, lemmatizing a part of a speech tagging in Catalan. We also use that for uh, Spanish. And then we converted uh, all these uh, tags uh, that were provided by Freeling into the standard the, uh, taxes proposed by Parliament. And probably we, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time with that, that uh, maybe if I we had to start again, we will do it otherwise. But uh, this is like it is, and, and we will be glad if there is a continuation of Parliament project to actually um, make things clearer and, and to, to, to correct some bugs still due to this conversion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as this has been uh, more or less already described, the, our corpus, like most of the others, contains this metadata for uh, timestamp terms, the speeches and are dated with the speaker, the role, as I told you, uh, with a lot of problems and a nightmare. And then we also have um, uh, uh, the transcriber comments with such gaps in the transcription or interruptions of applause. This was also uh, very, this was recovered from the word uh, files, and then we also have the speaker's name related with data of birth, the gender, the status, the party affiliation, and all this information that, as you have seen, enriches a lot the corpora and really makes it very useful for different types of uh, not only linguistic, but also uh, politics or sociological uh, works. Uh, and then as uh, uh, has been already described, all the linguistic annotation. And that's all. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Noemi Legatinaj. I'm from the Hungarian Research Center for Linguistics. And um, I'd like to briefly present an overview of the Hungarian uh, part of the parliament project. Um, let's begin with the uh, phase one, because the uh, Hungarian was also part of the uh, phase one of uh, the parliament project. But uh, then the Hungarian corpus was developed by the Center for Social Sciences. 
And this corpus only contained the interpolations and the urgent questions of the um, assembly, and it comprised approximately 870,000 tokens. It included contributions from uh, 194 speakers, uh, all of whom were members of the parliament. And this data set included some basic demographic information about the speakers, such as birth date and gender, and it covered the period from May uh, 2014 to December 2020. Uh, but uh, moving on to Parliament uh, 2, uh, we took over from the Center for Social Sciences, and this uh, second corpus was created by the Hungarian Research Center for Linguistics. And uh, this corpus expands the scope to include all types of settings and speeches. Uh, thus, it's significantly larger with over 30 million tokens. It features a wider array of speakers, 426, uh, including not only MPs, but uh, also many non-MPs as well. Uh, and this corpus goes beyond the basic demographic information to include um, info on organizations, parties, um, other affiliations with a total of uh, 91 different entities cataloged. And the time frame for this data extends from May 2014 to July 2023. Um, Yes, thank you. Um, let's walk through the steps if taken to prepare the corpus. Uh, so step one involved the collection of the texts. Um, we decided to drop, drop the Hungarian data from uh, the first phase of the parliament project and to start everything again from scratch. Um, uh, luckily, uh, all the texts are available uh, on the Hungarian National Assembly's homepage in an HTML format, uh, which ensures that they are well structured and um, any transcribers' notes, for example, are conveniently uh, indicated within parentheses. Um, the second step required some hands-on attention. Uh, we undertook a manual normalization process. Uh, for example, we had to remove some boilerplate text, and uh, the standardization of speaker names was uh, important to format them uniformly uh, for clarity. Uh, for example, here you can see uh, the name of the president of Hungary, uh, Katalin Novak, who appears in the corpus uh, under three different uh, names. Uh, so we had to unify those. Uh, next, uh, we focus on the uh, non-Hungarian segments. Um, these segments include the speeches from the representative of the German nationality in the parliament uh, and advocates for various minority languages, such as Polish, Slovakian, Slovenian, Serbian, Bulgarian, and Ukrainian, uh, totaling in 213 segments. Uh, and then the fourth step was the first uh, very um, uh, hard manual work. Um, we had to identify the session chairs because uh, they are only referred as anuk, meaning chair in the text, but uh, the exact person behind that um, string uh, is not always indicated and it's, it cannot be automatically uh, retrieved from the text. So uh, we had to find all the chairs uh, manually in a database and uh, connect that uh, with the data we have. Next slide, please. Um, yes, we initiated the text processing with Python scripts. Um, Luckily, again, each text file we retrieved is um, uh, originally one sitting of the parliament, so this makes the structure uh, easy to create. Uh, we retained the paragraphs as they were in the original documents, uh, so each paragraph is a separate segment in the XML output. Uh, the trans transcriber's notes uh, embedded in parentheses, as I mentioned, are handled using regular expressions uh, to accurately identify them. Then each segment got a unique identifier, and these segments were um, introduced to Huspace, which was the linguistic analyzer we used, and I will uh, talk about it uh, later. And finally, the output from the Huspace is uh, fed into an XML generator, which transforms the process text into the format that was required by the project. Um, what about the extensive metadata uh, that come with the corpus? Uh, First, we again decided to drop uh, the Parliament 1 uh, data uh, we have. Um, the manual collection phase included the collection of the MPs' basic uh, data and uh, other uh, data such as committee positions, party joining dates. And um, we also recorded the state start dates of appointments of uh, judges, for example, or other individuals who 
serve irrespective of parliamentary terms. Um, there is a particular interesting role, the Secretary of State. Uh, we have many uh, state secretaries and they have very specific titles and those titles vary across different parliamentary terms, even uh, inside the same ministry. And uh, we documented these details as uh, uh, detailed role names. Uh, so uh, we try to preserve the administrative hierarchy and functions. Um, there are two other interesting uh, roles, uh, junior notary or secretary and senior chairperson. Uh, these roles are only interesting or relevant on the first day of each parliamentary term. Um, so we only included them as notes and uh, those uh, titles were merged into the general categories of secretary and chairperson. Uh, we also provide links to the video recordings of the sittings, and um, it's important to note that uh, we uh, did not record the subcommittees uh, in the corpus. We don't have metadata on those. Uh, so the metadata consists of contributions from the 476 speak uh, 26 speak speakers and uh, involves 91 uh, organizations. For the linguistic annotation, we used the Hungarian um, member of the Stacey uh, family. Uh, which is recognized for its uh, high accuracy. We have uh, several compl complex pipelines for Hungarian, but uh, uh, this is uh, considered the best and the um, fastest. It, pro it provides all the modules that were required by the pro uh, project, and it covers the four uh, categories of named entities that were required. Uh, we use the CMM-based Hooker News large model uh, from Huspacy. We had to make a slight modification to the model of um, uh, named entity recognition output. We had to change the B to one uh, when um, talking about one token named entities. Uh, we met some inaccuracies in the named entity recognition output, uh, and it necessitated uh, uh, manual corrections to the input text because the validation often failed because of those named entities. But uh, overall, Huspesi uh, delivered an accurate and rapid analysis. So the next slide is just a comprehensive summary of the corpus um, with the metadata and the linguistic annotations, but you have already seen that uh, before. So uh, we can go to the next slide, which is which is about uh, what happened after we finished the corpus. So first, we introduced um, the results to the computational linguistics community. We had a poster presentation at the annual Hungarian Computational Linguistics Conference. Uh, this is uh, just the, uh, the poster we used. Uh, but on the next slide, um, we mentioned that we also had a workshop at our institute this November. Uh, here we invited, of course, the computational linguistics, but we also invited many scientists from uh, the SSH community, linguists. And uh, we also tried to reach out to those who uh, work closely um, to the uh, assembly, like the staff of the Hungarian National Assembly Office or the staff of the Library of the Assembly. Um, and uh, the workshop included a tutorial and a small hands-on experience with the corpus in the Noskot Shenzhen Concordancer. And we also have the first use case um, here in Hungary. Uh, two colleagues uh, focused on the terminology of the speeches and tried to answer the question uh, whether the discourse of uh, these parliamentary sittings qualifies as, or to what extent does it qualify as a professional or political communication? And uh, not surprisingly, it turned out that uh, policy actor speeches are more professional than those of the regular MPs in the parliament. Uh, but uh, this is just one small uh, uh, pilot project, and we are really excited to see uh, the many ways you and the scientific community can uh, dive into our corpus and uh, uh, we hope it's useful, especially given the increased interest in the Hungarian parliament and political public life. And thanks so much for listening. Um, I am finishing off this section with the uh, description of our individual uh, countries' contributions. So to give an overview of the final results, we delivered a, a parliamentary records from time span from 1996 to 22, with an overall of more than 800 speakers and total 1,200 something 
um, sessions and documents. The overall the overall uh, procedure was quite similar as that. The one for, we heard just heard from the from the Hungarian side. Uh, we were lucky to get the the base data very easily. It's provided publicly available by the um, Austrian Parliament. Um, the, it is provided in HTML and PDF. We chose the HTML version. Um, the good news is that the structure of the of this of these protocols was basically kept stable for the last twenty six years. So there was no need to to adapt for changes over time. The bad news was that the HTML was produced, originally produced as, I think, export from a very weird and old um, Microsoft Word version. So the HTML is extremely clobbered. There's tons of superfluous and nonsense tags in there. Um, again, as in Hungary, the speech uh, transcriber notes are, are marked as in, in parentheses and italics. I can say something about that later. And then the first step was to bringing this this clobbered HTML closer to the XML world or transform it to XML. It was done by oh, a, a bunch of Perl scripts uh, using undocumented and, and strange um, uh, regular expressions for string manipulation, just tidying things up. and. And then finally, using the program tidy to uh, produce XHTML. So, and as soon as we were in the so-called in the XML world, we were able to proceed with using XSLT scripts. And was it dozens of them? Um, the linguistic annotation for the linguistic linguistic annotation, we were very happy to be able to use the UDPipe uh, web service. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to Matthias Kopf for pointing that out to us. Uh, it would have been much more difficult without that. Next slide. Uh, as the last one in the presentation, I would like to share, apart from the technical details, I would like to share some fond memories on the, from that, from the, our time with the with, uh, with Parliament and some memories and some insights I gained. So the, the, the most important memory of, of our participation in Parliament was that it was the, the project, I, I called it a project of as good as done. So uh, we entered the, before we entered the Parliament in spring 22, uh, we already had been working with our parliamentary data and had produced some some TI form that was conformant with the Bala Clarine format, but was just almost finished. <laughs> and it turned, then it turned out that this going from almost finished to finished to half a year of, of really hard work. Uh, and the funny thing is, I think this all the other partners had a similar uh, similar experience. My Catalan, Catalan partner, just mentioned um, we spent an awful lot of time and she mentioned the word nightmare. So there were lots of tiny, smallish, not very interesting problems uh, had been solved. And there was always the danger to getting lost in transformations. So we did an awful lot of work on identifying these um, interjections, non-authorized interjections, and and put a whole classification on them, and finally decided to abandon this work and just do as everybody else in the consortium, just mark them as notes without further specification. So from the from the project experience, uh, something that was new to me was that we used Git as a primary tool of communication. So all the communication between me and the, the heroes of the project, namely uh, Tomas and Matthias, Tomas Evarts and Matthias Kopp, who 
who held the whole thing together and concorded, uh, uh, worked on the coordination and technical integration of all our efforts. All this, inf all this, this communication was done via JIT issue issues, and because we had a management that provided guidelines and took care of each and every issue, uh, this was a very, very pleasant uh, experience. They never were, uh, never became un, um, um, how to say, um, unpatient with my my longish longish uh, discussions on minor issues. Uh, they were super, uh, super uh, fast in responding and finding uh, pragmatic and still valid solutions for all the problems. Um, part of that work by the management uh, was uh, so providing uh, methods of automatic validation and to learn to, to estimate the beauty of that approach. It was really great to have things uh, validated in a, in a objective way and it was easy to proceed from then to, to uh, iron out the final problems. Uh, so the overall the overall uh, experience was one of of uh, to experience the dynamics of a common goal and tons of goodwill because we have to mention that there was not much financial uh, support uh, uh, supplied. So. Basically, it was a nominal fee, and so it was not uh, like in usually in a in European project. Uh, uh, we were not driven by by the fear to lose money if we don't succeed. But still, each and everybody did his best, and we we I think we came out with, with something very very nice, and this brought me the the satisfaction to see that my data, which had been a lot of work and it, which was sometimes a nightmare uh, is has an afterlife uh, without my involvement. So it's being enriched by others, machine translated, semantically tagged. That's really, really great. And of course, there's the satisfact satisfaction of seeing my data being used, used by others, by political scientists and so on. And that is, that is reward in itself. And thanks again to all of you who made that happen and and forced us finally next slide to go from the is it's good as done to it's done and it's good thanks uh before the q a i would like to ask daria to make an announcement slash reminder thanks a lot um i think the entire session was very informative and very valuable for everyone attending and also everyone who will be watching this uh, recording later on on YouTube. Uh, I also really liked the ending uh, that um, Hannes has left us with. Um, we, I believe, uh, are now all very inspired about how we could use Parliament results in our own work. Uh, and if you are inspired, uh, can you show the next slide, David? I would like to just uh, invite you to consider submitting um, your work to the workshop that we are planning in the context of Elric Calling uh, late in May um, in Turina, Italy. Um, it's called Parla Clarin. It's the fourth edition. And um, yeah, we are welcoming work on uh, all the um, uh, building of corpora in the parliamentary domain on all the work uh, using corpora uh, for um, research um, into parliamentary dis discussions, as well as combining these resources with other types of data. So uh, the deadline is still a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you're all welcome to submit. And I leave this um, for now and we can move on to the Q&A session. Do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Please either raise your hand or just speak up. It's a relatively manageable size of the group so we can keep this pretty informal.
while people are warming up and gathering uh, courage to ask a question, maybe I could ask a question to the uh, project coordinators. What are your plans for the future? Is this now going to start gathering dust? Do you have any more ambitious plans? Okay, so since I'm the representative of, of both coordinators, I can uh, share my opinion. So um, this project is, uh, as I said, already a framework. And um, so um, Tomas and Matthias, um, who really um, had the most intensive and hard work with uh, the Corpora, they provided the framework for any additions of uh, people who would like to add more data or a new language or new parliament or new region. Um, we have very good examples of that. So, um, yeah, we um, had some discussions uh, before that, that um, there will be possibilities for this and they will um, make them available. I already mentioned about the documentation and uh, the instructions and uh, the validation that is available and so on. Apart from that, um, we plan um, altogether, uh, again, I, I speak uh, from the whole team because, uh, yeah, this is the case. Um, also dissemination uh, events uh, per country, per region, uh, about uh, telling more about this corpora because one of the things that should be done is this corpora to they already started to be used but they have and it is ahead of us uh, to to show their strength and uh, their power um so um uh, daria with you and um, christina we prepared uh, slides for this and uh, soon we will contact the parliament group um, and uh, they will become available for them to start organizing such events um of course uh, apart from all this we are seeking for other uh, ways of um, continuing this initiative uh, like um some uh, European projects, different kinds of uh, projects, and um, not sure about the cost action because we already had, uh, I think, two attempts. And uh, these days, uh, since it is a very, very important and maybe basic tool of European um, yeah, colleagues to, to make projects uh, not so easy, but why not? Maybe we can consider this, this too. Uh, moreover, uh, we have really big con community and I, I expect that it will become even bigger with the time. Yeah, so I Thanks just look here. Thank you. That's all um, very inspiring. Nicola has a comment or question. Yes, yes, I wanted actually to add uh, something to what Petya has been saying. We refer to this data set often as a corpus. This is a beautiful linguistic corpus, but I'm of the deep impression, at least, that this can be so much more than that. We should continue um, further enriching this data with additional metadata like sentiment, spoken signal, etc., and allow for other researchers outside the linguistic uh, community to use these data sets as much as possible. Just an opinion on my side, why we should absolutely call it a corpus, but also work on this to become a general data set. Thanks, fully agreed. Martin, you have a, a question or a comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I was, um, you just mentioned um, further enhancing the corpus and adding more annotation. But I guess one obvious uh, piece of ongoing work would be to continue to add to the texts and to keep updating it and to make it a kind of monitor corpus for uh, parliamentary data. So I was uh, wondering if there are any uh, further plans for that. This is maybe a question for Tomas and Matias. Yeah, I can try to answer that. Uh, of course, yeah, it would be brilliant if we could make it into a monitor corpus, which would contain, well, speeches from yesterday or even today. Uh, the problem I see with this is, well, I see two problems, actually. One is that even now, uh, the partners from Parliament, one, 
did their work in Parliament too, kind of as an in-kind contribution, so without any payment. And the new partners didn't get all that much money, at least compared to the work they put in, I would say. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to expect all these partners to continue to work basically for free, especially as some of them had either students or research assistants or maybe hired people that did the work, which are no longer available. Uh, so that's a problem. On the other hand, they do have everything set up already. So it's much less of a problem than it was the first time around. So that would give me maybe a, a glimmer of hope that this could be maybe done. Um, the second problem, uh, well, opportunity problem, is that we put very much metadata and annotation into the corpus. Now, if you can automate the pipeline that takes you from the transcription to a nicely parliament encoded comparable corpus, you still need to uh, yeah, uh, get the additional metadata. So who is a minister, what kind of left, right uh, orientation a party has and so on. You have to do that basically by, by hand uh, or at least semi-automatically. And then you need to machine translate the corpus, semantically annotate the corpus. Maybe we will have it at some point uh, also sentiment annotation. So you have this all this overhead that even once the automatic part of the corpus building has been done, at least to keep it the same at the same level as all the other parliament corporate, there's still a lot of additional work by third parties, so to speak, not, not by the people actually making the corpus. Uh, so this is kind of my worries here that we will be able to do this. Uh, that said, uh, I think it would be lovely if we could keep updating the corpus because yeah, the moment you put it out, it's already outdated in a way. Yeah, at least if you expect something really recent to be in there. So yeah, well, thanks for the question. Thanks. Uh, I see that Magnus has uh, added a comment in chat. Ma Magnus, do you want to say something in addition to what you have written down? Um, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. both. I'm Magnus. I'm outside the, all this uh, corpus, but I work with Wikidata a lot. And what I can see, the diff what the Swedish corpora used was all the parliament members from the Wikidata. That's excellent. So then we have same as. But what I lack in the Swedish corpora is that when you have parties that you don't have persistent identifiers for parties, and then you don't use sources. Uh, in the same way as Wikidata has, and Wiki Wikipedia is known for not having sources, so, so being not delivering as good as Wikidata is a problem. So I would like to see some kind of uh, knowledge graph like Wikidata, where you work together over from different countries, saying that this party here is related to that party or something like that. Okay, uh, I think Michal has a related comment. Yeah, um, this is just a uh, rash with what, what Magnus said. Uh, there is a database that can be used um, for enriching um, the metadata we have currently uh, within the, the uh, Parliament universe, and it's called Pardefacts. So it's started as a as a university project, and now, um, especially in the world of of, of political science, uh, every Good data set uh, includes a party fact identifier uh, that is unique um, in that database, and through that identifier, you can you can connect your your data set and, and parliament data to to universe of uh, political science data sets. So there is Wikidata uh, identifier is great because it's consistent, but in political science, and this is domain specific, but still there is something that already exists and it's consistent and uh, it's getting more and more popular. And I think probably can benefit a lot of, uh, um, from, from this resource. Um, Michael, thanks. Could you put uh, a link in the yeah. uh, chat? So I will, that I will do that, I will do that, it? yes. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, in my private chat, I also have Chagri who wants to say something. Yes, briefly. Um... Patty already introduced the uh, share task. Um, uh, do, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, but I, I wanted to say a couple of more words about it. Uh, before that, just related to last comment, um, 
last year or the year before, um, a BA student here actually did a way to get the data for um, parliament members from the uh, Wikidata. Um, it wasn't that promising, so we didn't announce it at the end, but it, it is actually an interesting thing to also enrich the Wikidata with what, what is available in the parliament right now, because what we observed was uh, it wasn't really um, always complete uh, in the Wikidata either. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's also interesting. Um, so I, I'd like to briefly mention that we are running a shared task. So it is all uh, thanks to all this hard work. So we have a lot of data there. Uh, there are two subtasks that, we're, that we that we uh, offer. One is detection of ideologies, and the other one is well left right only, uh, very simplified. Uh, and the other one is detect. We call it identification of power, which uh, uh, to determine given a speech whether the speaker is part of the coalition or opposition. So all 29 parliaments are included. To uh, some didn't have, some doesn't have one or the other task, but uh, all of them are included. And um, the uh, earlier the uh, website for the share task was already present. So um, we already have about 20 people interested. So either by downloading the data, so subset of the data that we created for the purpose, um, well, they derived from the parliament already available uh, and or otherwise um, also registering for the um, uh, shared task. So what I'd like you to uh, actually, uh, if, if you are interested and if you can think people who would be interested in the task, uh, please advertise more, uh, encourage your students to join. It doesn't have to be a full uh, spectrum of parliaments, they can just work on a single parliament, single task, and uh, the results would, I think, be beneficial for all of us. That's all from me. For. I just want to say, Chagri, that I shared your link uh, also with everyone via chat. Okay, um, any other questions or comments? Would maybe the researchers who have had experience with the parliament uh, corpora or data sets, however you want to see them, uh, still be willing to share their experience, um, especially if they're not from uh, the narrow corpus linguistics paradigm? How did you interact with the corpus? Um, would you have any suggestions for improvements? Did you miss anything? Boyan, Michal? Yeah, uh, I can share a few words. So it was, for me, it was great to participate in a hackathon that uses uh, the corpus because I was able to see people from different backgrounds uh, having different tools uh, in their sleeves using the corpus uh, in different ways. And I, I think it, it's very... Uh, it's very good that Parliament is available in these separate formats as well in the concordances because in parallel, some of us were working with the XMLs, others with the CONLU files, and a third group with the concordances, whichever pipeline was uh, their go-to. Um, and that was really good. Um, I think... In the previous version, uh, there were some inconsistencies that we that were solved. So basically, as far as I remember, for my last experience with uh, preparing these large language model embeddings for each of the speeches, I was practically using the same pipeline for all the languages there. So that was really good. That that it was very consistent. I don't have much experience in political sciences to be able to tell what's missing. But yeah, uh, in general, my uh, uh, experience was yeah, very easy usage and nicely documented.
I think Michael wants to add something, correct? Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 uh, yeah, I've been in, yeah, I have engaged with the with the Parliament data quite a lot in in the past couple of months, and uh, um, it's great resource, uh, and I really like it. The thing I miss uh the most is is the metadata because in political science we we um mostly fit regression models and we need variables that we can use. Uh, so um, the idea and the discussion we already had about adding more metadata, um, um, consistent identifiers that you can use to connect um, core uh, corpora to something that um, is, is relevant to your field is really great idea. And, and I think that's, uh, that, that's something um, Clarin should pursue in the future. Um, and then second, you know, the, the, that's just my feeling, but um, um, the, the resources are great, uh, they are complex, uh, but they are presented and published in formats that are not really um, uh, close to um, a core political scientists, um, which makes it a bit harder to, to start um, working with, with the, the corporate. Also, uh, try to use it in, um, in a course, uh, and um, it's, it's really hard to explain to political science students um, how to work with nested data structures um, from, from scratch without spending too much time on that topic. Uh, so in the end, it was mostly about transforming everything to uh, uh, tabular uh, data sets or data frames, uh, and then using Python or R uh, for um, um, processing that. Um, so I think there is, there is more things that can be done and they are not necessarily um, time consuming or expensive in terms of, of, of labor or, or money in general. Um, to bring Clarin and uh, Parliament uh, closer to political science community. That's just my general feedback, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from the audience? If not, I have one final one. Um, as we uh, were able to see, the parliament map is now really impressive, but still not complete, at least if you look at uh, just Europe. Uh, will you uh, keep the initiative open to any new uh, parliamentary data sets if there are any teams that want to join um, after uh, the project is completed? Uh, how they, How can they do so? Um, maybe I can answer that, given that I was the the main editor. Um, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if anybody new would like to produce their corpus, uh, I would certainly help them. Then again, I have to say probably not as intensely as I or me and Matthias were doing during the project, right? So more in a kind of consultancy. Um, yeah, a role rather than hands-on role. But yeah, I'm kind of upset by the, the gray uh, areas in the middle of the, of the nicely blue or green or whatever they are. Uh, so yeah, in short, the answer is yes. Uh, just one more thing. I would like to refer to Michal's uh, statement that the formats that we have now are not really usable by the political scientist community. Now, uh, we actually went to some trouble to, uh, I can appreciate that TI and XML is not for everyone because it does need some getting used to. And there's a lot of different tags and they're nested and so on and so forth. Uh, but we did produce quite a few down conversions. Uh, for instance, all the per speech metadata is available in uh, tab separated files. And then you have plain text of all the speeches with the speech ID. So in, in case there's any new other formats that we could add to that, uh, please let us know. Yeah, uh, it shouldn't be too hard, I think, except if the downstream format is really complex. Uh, and the, the best way to do it would be simply to post an issue on, on GitHub. Yeah, that's why we have Git, not just to develop the programs and everything, but also to to have a platform where people can report issues, and this definitely would be an issue. So yeah, thanks. Michal? There's a reaction. It's, it's not an issue. That's our problem. We are the problem, not you. It's just, 
you know, uh, what what can be done to to bring the resources closer to us. Uh, and because it's not that complicated that I mentioned that, but there is nothing wrong with with uh, take format, and and it's really great that um, there is so much information uh, encoded in 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 formats you provided. Uh, thanks, Magnus. You had one last comment in the chat. So would you like to say anything about that? No, it was I. I mean, I just mentioned this for the Swedish project that there, there are other possibilities. So, speak with them. <laughs> I'm outside this. Good luck. We need Thank things you. like this, and and Wikidata should never be the source. It's we should have good sources. So, give us that. Thanks. Thank you. If there's uh, nothing to add, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and all the contributors to the Parliament Initiative for their amazing and valuable work. Um, there are valuable links still in the chat that David has just posted. Um, if you want, you can read more about Parliament on the Parliament website. Take a look at the call for papers for the uh, Parla Clarin workshop and stay up to date with the remaining uh, clearing cafes planned for this year. We have uh, quite a few lined up on other topics, of course, already. Uh, you can take a look at the uh, calendar in the last link. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude, conclude this cafe. Um, wish you all a wonderful afternoon and goodbye from Utrecht. Bye and thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye thank you. Bye.